And our top story this hour, formalize illegal miners. This is the call from the National Union of Mine Workers after the bodies of 14 suspected illegal miners were found in Binoni, Ekuruleni. Our reporter Natasha Piri has more. The disused mine shafts of Van Rain in Benoni is where illegal miners come to earn a living. The discovery of 14 bodies near one of the shafts have put miners in the area on high alert. We were inside the mine shaft and we heard a group of people shouting and chasing men. Next thing we know, we were told they are dead. We are not safe. It hurts that people we know are dead. From what I heard, Basutu Zamazamas killed each other. They were working in Mineshaft 13, which is dangerous. I think they fought amongst themselves and started killing each other. We are terrified of even stepping on their turf. The police have condemned the killings and have launched a probe into the incident. We don't know who are these uh, uh, victims. Uh, we believe they are illegal miners. And we are also appealing to the members of the public who might have info information about these uh, killings to come forward. All the information will be rewarded. In 2016, Kosatu called for the decriminalization and regulation of small scale mining. The National Union of Mine Workers is also putting their weight behind the call. The National Union of Mine Workers uh, Central Committee last year took a resolution to say that um, illegal mining uh, must be legalized so that uh, small miners must also play a role in the economy and also to, play, to pay tax. And um, we are worried, extremely worried about the killings that are happening uh, in, in, the, in the East Rand. The Department of Mineral Resources, they are the regulators of mining industry in South Africa. Where there are abandoned mines, they must make sure that uh, everywhere it is properly sealed and there is security. Because if you don't do that, illegal mining will continue. And then I feel that uh, the department must be hands-on. With yet another round of killings in the illegal mining sector, one has to ask if enough is being done to stem the tide. What is known is that a real solution to the issue won't be achieved unless the formalization of these illegal miners is debated. Acting Police Commissioner Homoto Patlani has condemned the senseless murder of 14 suspected illegal miners whose bodies were found over the past two days. He's indicated that the police are working around the clock to find the culprits. For ANN7, Natasha Piri, Ekurulen. And joining us is Christopher Rudledge, a mining and attractive uh, coordinator of Action Aid South Africa. Mariette Lifferink, a CEO for the Federation of a Sustainable Environment. Levuani Mamburu is acting a NUM national spokesperson. And Ayanda Shezi is from the Department of Mineral Resources. As their spokesperson, you at home, the lines are always open to you. Good evening uh, to our panelists in studio and welcome. Mariette, let's just start with you. I mean, you've been doing extensive work in terms of uh, acid mine drainage and the derelict mines that have been left uh, and subsequently impacting communities negatively. What progress has been made since uh, we last spoke in terms of government's intervention in this? Yeah, uh, I identification had been done of the risk areas. I may just here interpose that there are only one ownerless mine in the Gauteng with Watersrand Goldfield, but there are many mines that are being kept in warehousing and that often introduces attractive nuisances, uh, also uh, attracts of course unregulated artisanal mining. Uh, with regards to acid mine drainage, uh, the, the short term treatment of acid mine drainage, which uh, is an incomplete treatment that had been implemented since 2012. Uh, we've just had the launch of the Eastern Basin short-term treatment of acid mine drainage mm. and the long-term treatment of acid mine drainage by means of desalination has been uh, uh, announced. All right, so you, you, you now say there's an inventory of uh, mines that are essentially um, not without owners per se, but they're sitting in a warehouse, as you said. These create a problem because now there's an opportunity for illegal mine workers to go in there. 14 people have been assassinated, we told, uh, just in the past week uh, in Benoni. And, and your um, organization with NUM, what involvement or how can you press government to act on legalizing uh, this uh, activity? Yes, um, as a National Union of Mine Workers, uh, last year during our central committee, we, we passed a resolution to say that uh, illegal mining must be legalized so that uh, these small miners must play a role in the economy. 
and also um, in the economy and also because it's uh, to, uh, to play a role in the economy and also to pay tax. I think it's very important because now what we see, the situation is out of control. There's criminality, there's killings. So it's, it's, it's a worrying situation. As, as you said, that 14 uh, uh, illegal miners have already been killed. Issues of health and safety in illegal mining have, uh, have also deteriorated. Three years ago, as you remember, there were 20 uh, Zimbabweans who passed all died underground after uh, um, the, there was carbon monoxide underground. So that is why we're saying that um, uh, this, this uh, industry must, must be regulated and then it must be legalized. Yeah. Maria, do you think uh, the focus is misdirected in that there is a, a, a skewed view of always protecting industry and, uh, and the more established uh, economies as opposed to looking at opportunities to include small players like illegal miners? Yes. In fact, we were part of the um, advisory committee of the South African Human Rights Commission. We prefer to, the, to use the phrase not unlawful miners, but rather unregulated artisanal miners. And we definitely feel that these artisanal miners, if they are regulated, will protect not only the formal mining industry, but also the informal mining industry. Because these miners are exposed not only to the physical risks of mining, but also to because our gold ore co-occurs with uranium. So they're exposed to the chemical toxicity of metals and uranium and radioactivity. We must also remember that while the formal mines are regulated in terms of our legal matrix, that is the National Nuclear Regulators Act, National Water Act, National Environmental Management Act, the same regulations are not applicable to unregulated miners and therefore they are exposed not only to uh, the f physical risks but also to mercury because mercury is used for the leaching of gold. Mm. Let's invite Chris uh, Rutledge, uh, Mining and Extractives Coordinator with Action Aid SA. Uh, Christopher, thanks so much for joining us. I mean, you've been also uh, hands on in this particular matter trying to get uh, the the, the sector regulated. Is there an appetite, though, from the uh, Department of Mineral Resources and government in general? Uh, yes, thanks, Cindy. Cindy, let me just say that I think that the, we must start from the premise that it appears as if black lives are just so cheap, and that poor black lives are even cheaper. This is not something new. We have been engaging the department and the legislatures on this question for a very long time, and we keep on ignoring the central issue, and that is how do we decolonize our mining infrastructure? We are so caught up in a Western colonial mindset of, of mining that this unique opportunity, as the spokesperson from NUM was saying, and as uh, your previous speaker was saying, this is an opportunity for us to deregulate the economy, to build a renewed economy from the bottom up with ordinary people taking a share of the country's wealth as it is set out in the Freedom Charter and as our Constitution uh, holds us to account for. And yet we, we, we keep on ignoring the problem as if it's going to go away. Another 14 lives. I mean, where, where does this all stop? You know, one, one really starts to, to wonder in whose interest are we legislating? But Christopher, if, if I were, were to, to just remind you, remember the uh, mining in Daba, the annual event, had uh, an alternative version there of community members uh, reaching out in essence to say, please include us in the, in the bigger economy. And clearly there is still a disjoint in how uh, the, the sector operates. So from, from you, can you give us a sense whether there's a white paper on the table? What are, how advanced are discussions on this matter? So we actually now, um, as a coalition of civil society organizations, which includes well over 16 uh, civil society organizations and community-based organizations, we have put on the table a proposal to the legislature, to the National Council of Provinces, because the NPRBA, the mining legislation, is currently before the, N the NCOP uh, for, um, for consideration. And we put on the table uh, legis proposals and legislation uh, suggestions in which this question of artisanal miners can be introduced and can be included in our legislative re regime. Whether they are going to actually take those 
proposals into consideration is another question because our, the history of our legislature show that they have no interest in any consultation. They only listen to big business and they only do what big business wants. So the proposals are there. It's on the table. It's a question of will they listen and will they move in a direction that will benefit the country as a whole and not just uh, a small elite. All right, just stay on the line, if you will, just uh, with no, especially the responsibility or onus on uh, the mine owners or rather companies as well in securing the mines, rehabilitating the environment around them as opposed to looting the minerals and leaving uh, uh, communities desperate and destitute. Is there adequate uh, punishment, if you will, for, for mine operators that, uh, that just leave these mines derelict? No, uh, as the NEM, we have observed that a lot of mine, uh, mine mining uh, companies, when they when they, they when the operation has reached its lifespan, they just disappear. And remember, there is also a rehabilitation fund. What is DMR, Department of Mineral Resources, doing to make sure that uh, that fund is available when the mine has reached its lifespan? We feel that uh, the Department of Mineral Resources must do more, and also the Chamber of Mines must force its members that uh, when, they, when the mine has reached its last span, they must make sure that mine is rehabilit rehabilitated. So we do, we're not seeing that at the moment. So we just, we feel that the DMR as the regulator is not doing enough and the Chamber of Mine, it must make sure that uh, it, 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 it forces its members to rehabilitate its, uh, the, the mines after uh, when the mine has reached its last span. Mm. But, but I mean, with these kind of activities now, very brazen execution style killings between rival uh, illegal miners fighting for, for, for war, or rather territory, um, th this environment of, of course perpetuates this kind of behavior because there is no oversight, there is uh, no accountability, there's impunity in terms of the, the mining operators themselves. Uh, so Mariette, I mean, it's a difficult one to answer yes. in, in, in one uh, discussion, but what needs to, to, to happen in the immediate? First of all, when there is cessation of mining or even temporary cessation of mining, there ought to be an application for closure. Closure would address, for example, the rehabilitation of mined land to either a pre-mining uh, status or to a new predetermined and agreed upon land use, a sustainable land use. What we often find is uh, currently the reclamation operations leave a certain portions of a mine dump unremined. Un, uh, uh, In other words, not reclaimed. It's not completely reclaimed and the footprints also not rehabilitated. Uh, what we also find is closure certificates are not being applied for and neither does the Department of Mineral Resources issue closure certificates by by law, that is in terms of the EIA 2014 regulations and also the 2015 financial provision regulations, the Department of Mineral Resources ought to issue these closure certificates. When a closure certificate is issued, then the state takes over responsibility and also liability. Uh, in the last 20 years, the Department of Mineral Resources had not issued one closure certificate with regards to the gold fields uh, operations within the Witwatersrand. Mm. So, so they, they absolutely, they're absolving their own responsibility in this case. Uh, we're trying to get Ayanda, I believe she may be on the line soon, to answer that. Why, why is, it, is it lack of uh, account, what, what, what is it, in action rather, on the department side, or is it a case of uh, incapacity? There is also a disconnect between our different laws. There was an excellent paper written on the facilitation of the dereliction of duty of care. There is a gap or a disconnect between the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act, our Companies Act and the Insolvency Act. The Insolvency Act also makes provision in the Companies Act for mining companies to declare winding up or liquidation or bankruptcy. But then the rehabilitation funds are not ring-fenced and the liquidator may use those rehabilitation funds to distribute to the creditors with the environment, the rehabilitation of the environment, having no claim. So disconnect between these different acts of parliament need to be addressed, gaps in uh, information. There has to be an apportionment of liability because a wide pool of persons are responsible and liable according to our National Environmental Management Act and the National Water Act. Yeah, but I mean it seems like such a, 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 a vertical um, a 
value chain that it is difficult to just pinpoint who, who, who needs to take accountability. But there are lives lost. These are breadwinners. Uh, and we're not even following where the minerals are going in terms of once it's extracted, uh, there's obviously a market for it. Who is procuring these minerals? And we perhaps start the clamp down from there. Uh, that's a difficult one because, the, as you know, that illegal mining is not regulated. And it, 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 it happens in the dark. And um, uh, for us, we, we, we don't know. We haven't done any research on that. But um, from we have spoken to some of our members. I've spoken to some of our members who, who said that um, um, uh, police are also involved in, 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 in protecting some of these illegal miners because there's a lot of money involved. So we don't know where it's going. But what we also heard that it goes locally, internationally also. There's mm. a syndicate locally and internationally where some of these uh, gold uh, that has been mined illegally goes through through the OR Tambo Airport. Mm. All right, let's take a call. Uh, hi, Tom. Uh, thanks for your patience. Good evening to you. You're calling from Joburg. Good evening to you, Cindy. Yes, sir. Um, um, I'm directing this to the gentleman next to you there. That how are we going to really legalize uh, these foreign national when they themselves are illegal how are we going to do this how possible is that Okay, so it's a double whammy as it, as it were, Tom. Thanks so much for your call. Uh, and we'll give that uh, perhaps to uh, Christopher L Rutledge as well to explain, you know, if you are going to start with the process of regulating the operations itself, you need to look at uh, the documentation of those operating in those mines in the first place. Christopher, what kind of work have you done in trying to ensure uh, that the requisite uh, documentation is there? Yeah, thanks, Cindy. First of all, I want to say that it is a complete myth that the illegal or the artisanal miners are mainly uh, foreigners. I'm not denying that there are foreigners working in South Africa, but then again, we cannot deny that foreigners uh, or, or people from outside of the borders of South Africa have been working in the South African mines uh, since the very beginning. So our history is a shared history. It's a connected history. Uh, so we cannot now turn our backs on our brothers and sisters and say, well, you know what, you helped us uh, build the industry, but now you need to go back home. Uh, it's like somebody said, you know, there was a theater for coming in, but there's nothing for going out. And so our experience is, is that the people that we are engaging are ordinary, hardworking, young South African people who are desperate for a job, desperate for an income. And those 14 bodies who are laying in the fields, not even the police can tell whether they are South African or whether they are foreigners. So that really is inconsequential. That is, that is not the point. The point is, is that South Africa and our history is a broader history. And we cannot now single out uh, people because of where they were born. That, for me, is a totally unacceptable starting point uh, in how do we deal with this. There are mechanisms for us to, to resolve it. In Kimberley, we've been working with a group of over 2,000 miners, and we've been trying to regulate them. But we've, we, what we've seen is, is that the Department of Mineral Resources is completely a spanner in the works. They, they, their bona fides have proven to be uh, problematic. Where we have given them names, ID numbers, and documents of people who are working as artisanal miners, they have gone and given that to the police. I mean, that's really not what we, we need if we want to regulate the industry and if we want to, want to bring South Africans into the economy. We don't need the DMR working hand in hand in cahoots with big business. I mean, that's just unacceptable. All right. So, so but inter yeah, started. yeah, sorry, Christopher. So, but in calling for at least uh, the preservation of life, uh, where is the action plan from the Department of Mineral Resources to ensure that these mines are adequately shut and properly closed? Uh, and, and also the, uh, uh, the Chamber of Mines as well, their involvement. Look, the DMR has outsourced a lot of the closure of the mines to, to companies um, who, are, who, who specialize in mine closures. So there are efforts afoot, um, I know, but it's, it's very slow going. And in speaking to some of these companies, 
What they're saying is where they come to, to mind, they're already finding people, artisanal miners working there. Mm. And engaging those artisanal miners is, virt- is, is very difficult. And even if they do close the mine, the mine is reopened within a week of them leaving. So the problem here is, is a greater one. You know, the, I mean, we can send in these companies to close the mines and so forth. But what we need to do is find a more comprehensive, all-inclusive solution where we are not as the DMR seems to be doing, trying to work in pockets and trying to work in silos, in isolation to what is happening in the rest of the country. You know, I mean, they're really not being focused on a wholesome and full uh, resolution to this problem. So they're All right, talking Christoph, yeah, sorry, please stay on the line. Let me uh, have callers in Cape Town. James, thanks so much uh, for holding and good evening to you. Good evening, Cindy. I, I, I don't think legalizing the, 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 the abandoned mines is the way to go. I think we, we really need to, to check if, if also the Zamazamas are, are, are people who are qualified to do those jobs. And my other question is who will take responsibility if the mine uh, collapses? Because these people don't have all those uh, capabilities to check if the mine is safe. After you saw the, the way to go is yeah. these mines must close those mines. Then we, if we have to open small mines for those small miners, it's All right, let, that, that can be a parallel process. Thanks so much, uh, James. George in the Val, uh, we'll end with you. Good evening to you. Good evening, Cindy. Um, I, ju- I just want to get clarity um, in terms of legalizing the illegal um, miners. Because we might have a problem with labor relations also, because you need to follow processes in appointing those people. All um, right, let, let's get our panelists. Sorry to rush you. We're out of time. Very briefly, uh, Mr. Mamburu, just in, in how, what shape and form will this uh, regulation take uh, of uh, illegal miners? I mean, we, we have the regulator in South Africa, which is DMR. Uh, they, they must take charge. And also, when, with, with the issue of illegal miners working in the, in the illegal uh, mining industry, I mean, the Department of Home Affairs can work with uh, law enforcement agencies in South Africa. I mean, that, that should be the, the, the solution. Also, to stop illegal mining in South Africa, we have to deal with issues of poverty, inequality. Uh, if we don't deal with those issues, illegal mining will continue. All right.